This presentation provides information on proposed changes to departure and arrival flight procedures implemented by the Federal Aviation Administration at Louisville Muhammad Ali International Airport. Louisville Muhammad Ali International Airport has been serving commercial passengers since 1947. The airport is often referred to by its aviation identifier, SDF. In 2002, UPS opened Worldport, a package sorting center at Louisville International Airport. Over the years, UPS expanded their operations and in 2005 chose Louisville as its heavy air freight hub. The airport is now the third largest cargo airport in North America. As part of a nationwide program, the FAA is updating arrival and departure procedures to better connect SDF with other airports. This project is part of the FAA's nationwide strategy to modernize the entire national airspace system with satellite-based flight procedures. Why is this important? Modernization helps ensure that every city, including Louisville, is kept on the forefront of aviation technology, and that airports and overall airspace system have the structure to enable air traffic to move safely and efficiently throughout the country. We are also working to enhance aviation safety, reduce fuel emissions, and reduce delays, all while getting people and packages to their destinations quicker. Satellite-based procedures prepare the airport for the future. Airports are economic drivers for their communities. In 2022, the FAA control tower at SDF handled a busy mix of cargo, passenger, and general aviation traffic. The airport reached new heights with over 175,000 operations, providing vital connections to the residents and businesses around the Louisville area. How do planes approach and depart at Louisville Muhammad Ali International Airport? Generally, aircraft take off and land into the wind, and runways are built to align with wind patterns specific to the area. SDF has three runways. Two are in a north-south configuration, and one is in an east-west configuration. At SDF, air traffic control regularly changes runways to decrease air traffic volume of congested areas. This is called contraflow. It is the airport's primary noise abatement procedure and has been in place for several years. Scheduled runway changes for noise are set as follows. South flow from 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. North flow from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. South flow from 12 p.m. to 9 p.m. North flow from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. However, when wind conditions, weather, or other air traffic circumstances require runway use other than noted, air traffic control will change flows to accommodate those needs and return to contraflow as soon as possible. Louisville is one of the few airports in the nation with extensive nighttime operations due to cargo activity. During nighttime operations, aircraft typically arrive from about 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. and depart from about 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. How will the new satellite-based procedures improve traffic flow and reduce delays? Older procedures, including ground-based navigational aids, force aircraft to fly on invisible routes in the sky, passing over fixed points. Air traffic routes were therefore limited by the placement of these ground-based nav aids. Satellite-based procedures eliminate those ground-fixed points, allowing aircraft to fly in more direct routes, streamlining movement and reducing flight times. Satellite navigation is more precise, which means these routes will be more predictable while keeping aircraft safely separated. New arrival procedures will use Optimized Profile Descents, or OPDs. OPDs enable aircraft to descend without leveling off. This enables aircraft to glide under minimal power, which can reduce aircraft engine noise and emissions. The new arrival procedures allow for near-idle power approaches while keeping aircraft higher as long as possible. Similar to arrivals, new departure routes will efficiently climb aircraft out of the airport to both domestic and international locations. Aircraft departing SDF airport day and night will fly more consistent paths than they do today, while maintaining the airport's voluntary noise abatement measures. Arrivals and departures are now procedurally separated, allowing the controller to leave aircraft on published procedures and avoid eliminating unnecessary transmissions. 
Fewer transmissions reduces workload for the pilots and minimizes the likelihood of readback errors. As a resident, what will the new procedures mean for you? Travelers can anticipate a better flow of traffic in and out of SDF Airport, including reduced delays and improved travel in most weather conditions. Air traffic operations will become even safer through more predictable procedures. Planes will use less fuel, resulting in reduced carbon emissions. The number, type of aircraft, and operations at SDF, including passenger, cargo, business, and small general aviation, is market-driven. The FAA's mission is to move air traffic safely and efficiently. Updated air traffic procedures will help SDF maintain its position as a key airport in the nationwide system and help meet the demands of the future. Each new arrival and departure procedure meets FAA safety standards. All procedures went through industry flight simulations and flyability testing. The process to create, test, communicate, and ultimately publish a procedure typically takes well over two years. An environmental review is ongoing and will conclude after the public has had an opportunity to provide comments and those comments are evaluated. Would you like to know more? Please visit our website. Welcome to the FAA's Public Information Workshop for the proposed performance-based navigation flight procedures at the Louisville Muhammad Ali International Airport, or SDF. My name is Dan Mann, and I'm the Executive Director for the Louisville Regional Airport Authority. I thank the FAA for hosting this workshop and including the Louisville community as they assess proposed improvements to the nation's airspace system. We support events just like this one to engage with the community. We believe they provide an opportunity to inform others of the decision-making process, as well as ability to directly respond to questions from airport neighbors and the community about these proposed enhancements to the airspace. I'd like to offer a little background about SDF for those who may not know. Eight airlines serve SDF, offering nonstop service to more than 35 destinations around the country. We are the fastest growing airport in the U.S. and expect to set new passenger records this year. I'm also proud that we are the home of UPS Worldport, the center of UPS's worldwide air network that moves millions of tons of product and life-saving cargo each year. Louisville is a global leader when it comes to cargo operations. We are the third busiest cargo airport in North America and the fifth busiest in the world. SDF is an economic powerhouse for the region, generating $10.4 billion in economic impact annually. More importantly, the airport directly and indirectly is a source of more than 82,000 jobs and more than $450 million in state and local taxes. This is equal to one in eight jobs in the metro area and nearly one dollar of every seven dollars in Louisville metro tax revenue. With the importance of SDF to the region and its role as part of the nationwide airspace system, we appreciate you taking time to learn more about the proposed enhancements from the FAA. I also want to thank the FAA again for hosting this workshop and engaging the community in its discussions about the Louisville area. I wish you all a productive and informative meeting today. Thank you. Welcome to the FAA's Virtual Public Workshop on the Proposed Performance-Based Navigation, or PBN, Flight Procedures at the Louisville Muhammad Ali International Airport. We're glad you could join us for this virtual meeting event. I'm Michael O'Hara, the Regional Administrator for the FAA Southern Region, and I'll be your moderator for today's meeting. Our nation's airspace is the busiest and most complex in the world. And the FAA mission is to ensure that every flight moves safely and efficiently throughout our airspace. As you saw in the project video, Louisville is certainly an important part of our aviation network. The purpose of this meeting is to inform the public on the proposed flight procedure changes at the Louisville International Airport and share some of the challenges we are working to address. First and foremost, these modifications are designed to increase safety and efficiency. There's a safety benefit when departures and arrivals are procedurally separated. This helps keep planes at a safe distance from each other and reduces the need for pilot-controller interaction. There are noise mitigation benefits when departures are able to climb to higher altitudes more quickly. 
for arrivals. There are benefits from new optimized profiles that allow for idle thrust descents, which may reduce noise and carbon emissions. With that quick intro, I'll walk through the agenda for our workshop. The meeting will start with the FAA's detailed presentation of the proposed flight procedures. Afterwards, our panel of experts will host a live Q&A session responding to your questions submitted on Zoom or YouTube. After the Q&A session, we'll adjourn the meeting with brief closing remarks. For those of you joining us on Zoom, your microphones are muted and your cameras are off. To submit a question during the Q&A session, please enter your written question in the Q&A tab on the Zoom platform. If you are attending this meeting on one of our social media channels, please click on the Q&A link in the comments section to be directed to our Google form. You can also post your question directly in the comments thread. If you're having technical issues connecting to the virtual meeting, you can text our technical support team at 949-478-0253 anytime during the workshop. This phone number is for text messages for technical support only. The FAA will be collecting comments on this proposal, so we encourage you to join the conversation. Please note, submitting a question during the live Q&A session today is not the same as providing a formal written comment. If you have a formal comment, you need to either mail them to the FAA at 10101 Hillwood Parkway, Fort Worth, Texas, 76177, or email them to the address shown on the screen. All formal written comments must be sent by Friday, December 22nd, 2023. Now I will turn it over to Christian and Greg. Hello. My name is Christian Cobbler, and I'm an air traffic control specialist in the FAA control tower at Louisville Muhammad Ali International Airport. I have 20 years of experience controlling aircraft in the Louisville airspace. Today, we will walk you through the flight procedure poster boards for the proposed arrival and departure procedures at Louisville Muhammad Ali International Airport, also known as SDF. Each board will show either proposed departure or arrival procedures, along with current flight tracks color coded by altitude. Departures are referred to as SIDS, or Standard Instrument Departures. Arrivals are referred to as STARS, or Standard Terminal Arrival Routes. Proposed departure and arrival procedures will be shown on two separate boards, one providing an expanded view and another zoomed in to show additional detail. The flight tracks and procedures are overlaid on a street map of the surrounding area. Each flight procedure board is oriented with north at the top. Arrows for departure procedures point away from the airport while arrows for arrival procedures point towards the airport. The spelling of each procedure name is limited to five letters. The departure identified with the letters S-P-I-L-R is pronounced spiller. The proposed procedures allow aircraft to use satellites for guidance instead of ground-based navigational aids. The stars on the board represent locations of waypoints, which are fixed navigational points in space that the aircraft fly to. The proposed Flight procedures are colored purple for departures and orange for arrivals. These colored paths show the proposed flight paths for both inbound and outbound aircraft. Surrounding the paths are dispersed path areas and either pink for departures or yellow for arrivals. Aircraft in these areas are vectored to ensure proper spacing and sequencing between other aircraft. A vector is a compass heading assignment issued by an air traffic controller for aircraft to fly. These dispersed flight path areas also reflect flight tracks to avoid traffic conflicts operational needs of controllers or pilots, or safety considerations. While aircraft departing or arriving may be vectored off the procedure for the reasons previously mentioned, controllers will prioritize utilizing the proposed procedures whenever air traffic conditions allow. The bullet points on the right side of the boards provide additional details about the procedures. Let's begin with an examination of the proposed departure procedures. Hello. My name is Greg Petto, and I'm an air traffic controller at the Louisville Muhammad Ali International Airport. I have over 23 years experience controlling aircraft in the Louisville airspace. On the following boards, I will introduce the proposed departure procedures. 
These procedures are called SIDS, Standard Instrument Departure Procedures. I will explain how aircraft will depart SDF airport during both the daytime and nighttime hours. The new departure procedures will be utilized both day and night, so aircraft departing during nighttime operations will fly more precise paths like they will during the day. This board shows an expanded view of the existing daytime flight tracks and proposed SIDS for aircraft departing runway 35 left and 35 right. Daytime operations generally fall between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. This board shows a zoomed in view of both the existing daytime flight tracks and proposed SIDS for aircraft departing runway 35 left and 35 right. After collaboration with the Community Noise Forum, the proposed departure procedures were amended to relocate the runway 35 left initial waypoint to ensure that departing aircraft begin westbound turns farther north than today. This change will allow aircraft to avoid populated areas in West Louisville and keep flight paths over the river as much as possible. Similarly, the second waypoint off runway 35 right was moved to ensure that westbound flight paths remain over the river. This change mitigated equipment related issues experienced by certain departing UPS aircraft. These equipment anomalies prevented the use of the more precise departure procedure and resulted in the use of inconsistent vectors. Aircraft departing runway 35 right eastbound will fly exactly as they do today, remaining over the river as much as possible. This board shows an expanded view of both the existing nighttime flight tracks and proposed SIDS for aircraft departing runway 35 left and 35 right. As a major cargo hub, SDF is one of the few airports in the nation with extensive nighttime operations. UPS's nighttime operations fall primarily between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m which includes a heavy departure period between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Currently, nighttime operations do not utilize the GPS-based procedures that are employed during the daytime. This board shows a zoomed-in view of both the existing nighttime flight tracks and proposed SIDS for aircraft departing runway 35 left and 35 right. This board shows an expanded view of both the existing daytime flight tracks and proposed SIDS for aircraft departing runway 17 left and 17 right. As a reminder, daytime operations generally fall between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. This board shows a zoomed in view of both the existing daytime flight tracks and proposed SIDS for aircraft departing runways 17 left and 17 right. The initial waypoint off 17 right was relocated farther from the airport to allow westbound aircraft to turn beyond sensitive areas to the south while not deviating from the current daytime flight path. This board shows an expanded view of both the existing nighttime flight tracks and proposed SIDS for aircraft departing runways 17 left and 17 right. Nighttime operations fall between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m which includes a heavy departure period between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Existing contraflow procedures dictate a preference for south departures during these hours, weather and winds permitting. This board shows a zoomed in view of both the existing nighttime flight tracks and proposed SIDS for aircraft departing runway 17 right and 17 left. Again, the new departure procedures will be utilized both day and night so aircraft departing during nighttime operations will fly more precise flight paths like they will during the day. Next, let's move to an examination of the proposed arrival procedures. This board shows an expanded view of both the existing flight tracks and proposed arrival procedures called STARS for aircraft landing south on runway 17 left and 17 right. For arrivals from the southwest and southeast, aircraft landing runways 17 left or 17 right will fly the proposed procedures to a point where they are given vectors by controllers to the final approach course to land. For aircraft arriving from the northwest and northeast, the procedures will allow aircraft to join the final approach course and fly a controlled straight-in approach. This board shows a zoomed-in view of the existing flight tracks and proposed arrival procedures for aircraft landing south on runway 17 left and 17 right. This board shows an expanded view of the existing flight tracks and proposed arrival procedures for aircraft landing north on runway 35 left and 35 right. For arrivals from the northwest and northeast, 
Aircraft landing runways 35 left or 35 right will fly the proposed procedure to a point where they are then given vectors by controllers to the final approach course to land. For aircraft arriving from the southwest and southeast, the procedures will allow the aircraft to join the final approach course and fly a controlled straight in approach. This board shows a zoomed in view of the existing flight tracks and proposed arrival procedures for aircraft landing north on runway 35 left and 35 right. Hello. My name is Gregory Hines, and I am an environmental protection specialist. In the following slides, I'll discuss the FAA study in environmental processes. Any changes to flight procedures must go through a study process. The proposed procedures go through numerous reviews, and the public can review and comment on the proposed action. The FAA is required to review and consider every comment. Once the agency has read and considered all comments, it decides whether to proceed with the project. The agency may adapt procedure changes that are identical or like the initial proposal, or the agency may make changes based on comments received from the public. The virtual proposed procedure workshops is an important part of the process that comes before implementation of the procedures. Before any changes can be made, the proposed procedures must also go through an environmental review, which was required by the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. NEPA requires that the agency evaluate environmental and related socioeconomic effects of the proposed action. The review includes a preliminary technical review, a preliminary environmental review, an internal review, and choice of appropriate NEPA review, which could include extraordinary circumstances and significant impacts. Thank you, and I turn it back over to Michael. We're now ready to begin the live Q&A session with the expert panel. Again, we encourage you to submit any written comments you may have on the proposal. To do so, you may mail them to the FAA at 10101 Hillwood Parkway, Fort Worth, Texas 76177, or send them via email to the address shown on the screen. All formal written comments must be sent by Friday, December 22, 2023. Hello again, I'm Michael O'Hara. I'm the Regional Administrator for FAA Southern Region. Thank you for participating in our virtual public workshop. I'm the moderator for this discussion, and I look forward to hearing your questions about this proposal. As you heard, you can submit your questions at any time by entering them into the Q&A window in Zoom, or if you're watching us live on YouTube, you can enter your questions into the Google form that is on your screen. Please note that these forms are for questions about this proposal only. Before we get started with questions and answers, I'd like to cover three procedural items. First, if you're having technical issues connecting to the workshop, you can text our tech support number anytime during the workshop at 949-478-0253. For our audience that would like to use closed captions, Click on Live Transcript on the lower portion of your Zoom screen and then select Show Subtitle. To remove the closed captions, click on Live Transcripts and click Hide Subtitle, and that will turn them off. Second, we have 90 minutes remaining in this workshop. The one today is the first of two workshops scheduled. The second one will be this Thursday, November 16th at 6 p.m. Eastern. If you would like, you certainly may attend that workshop as well. And third, we're also live streaming on the FA's YouTube channel. A recording of this workshop will be available on this channel immediately after the broadcast. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Christian Cobbler is an FAA air traffic control specialist at Louisville International Airport. Jeffrey Chester is the FAA district support manager for airspace and procedures. Gregory Hines is an FAA Environmental Protection Specialist. Greg Petto is an FAA Procedure Specialist. Captain Jeff Kozak is a pilot for UPS Airlines. And Natalie Chaduin is Director of Public Relations at the Louisville Regional Airport Authority. Thank you all for being a part of this panel and sharing your expertise with us. 
We're all excited to discuss the work we're proposing at Louisville, answer your questions, and continue a meaningful dialogue with members of this community. And to that end, let's start with the first question. First, I'm going to ask UPS to share a little bit about how they operate the different types of aircraft here, uh, here in the Louisville area. I know UPS has a mixed fleet, including some very large aircraft. Captain Jeff, good afternoon. Thank you. Well, th Michael, thanks for letting me have the first question. So uh, UPS uh, uh, operates um, uh, several different uh, large aircraft to include the Airbus uh, 300, the Boeing 757, the Boeing 767, the Boeing 747-400, and the Boeing 747-8, which is the biggest airplane we fly. And I fly the MD-11 at uh, UPS. Uh, you know, the biggest difference between flying cargo and passengers, which I've done both, is it's just uh, they just they both have a different mission, right? It's like uh, getting on a bus versus getting into the back of a truck. Um, you can load up a tractor trailer full to the top, and it's much heavier and uh, um, requires a lot more energy to move and stop. And airplanes are the same way. In order for our biggest airplane, a Boeing 747-8, uh, to take off at max weight, which is almost a million pounds, think about that, almost a million pounds of cargo or total weight of that aircraft, it's got to be flying a little bit faster than an aircraft of lesser weight or uh, um, volume. So that's the difference. Uh, very rarely did you ever get close to uh, your max weight in a passenger airplane, but at, Bo at uh, UPS, for efficiencies, we try to load that airplane up as much as we can to, to be as efficient as possible. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, I, I may give you one more since you're, you're full on my screen here. Um, as we heard in the video, Louisville's one of the few airports with a lot of nighttime activity due to the UPS World Port. Can you tell us a little bit about why cargo aircraft depart uh, and arrive at night, how those operations are different than daytime operations for UPS? Yeah, night, nighttime flights um, allow us to get all those overnight packages any place, almost any place in the world uh, in a very short amount of time. So they're vital to helping UPS meet the tight delivery schedule. Uh, by flying packages at night, uh, the company can expedite uh, the transportation process in a more timely manner. Part of that is due to um, just traffic, right? Uh, passenger airlines take up the majority of the traffic during the day. At nighttime, passengers don't fly. So it's much more efficient. We, get, we can streamline those efforts getting into Worldport from all the different airports around the United States and different places uh, internationally coming right to uh, Louisville, whereas we wouldn't be able to do that at the high volume that's uh, in the air during the day. All right, great. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jeff. I'm gonna move on to the next question. Can you elaborate on the noise study process? Uh, Greg Hines, I think that one's, that one's yours. Thank you, Michael. Um, appreciate that question. During the, during the uh, noise process, we look at several fa factors when we're studying noise. During uh, air traffic operations and fleet mix, uh, we look at where the aircraft are currently flying, comparing, comparing to the new procedure or procedure changes. Uh, we factor in runway uses as well as uh, uh, you know a few other factors that, that are taken into consideration during the process. And for this project, uh, the noise screen does not show any change in noise uh, from these procedure changes that we just uh, developed. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Gregory. I'm going to keep moving through the questions. Thanks for submitting those to us so we can do our best to provide information about the proposed procedures. The next question, I live in, I live southwest of the airport and depending on the time of day, it seems like more aircraft depart over my house. How do airlines decide which procedure to use and which runway to use for takeoff? So that's probably going to be a joint. It asks about airlines, Jeff, but um, it will share on air traffic control perspective. I don't know who wants to start with that. Um, 
Christian or Greg, do you want to address that? And then I'll see if Captain Jeff has anything to add. Sure, Michael, I'll, I'll get started with that. So I think it needs to kind of back up to the destination. So the, the airlines don't decide the procedure, the airlines decide the destination and then before and then works the route and then works the procedure and then works the runway. So it kind of depends on where they're going and what runway they get. And so if an aircraft is going to go westbound, then they're usually going to try to get the west runway. So they're on that side of the field, eastbound, preferably the east runway. And uh, there's just a lot of factors like that to come into play. So it's not so much the airline's decision as it is kind of a collaborative decision on how it all comes together. Greg, I think you can probably add something to that. Well, just a reminder that aircraft do depart into the wind. And so uh, sometimes that with the wind changes or with weather, airport construction, things of that nature, that could affect what runway we utilize any given day. So that's something that could impact the, uh, the number of airplanes you see over your house. Great. Thank you both. Uh, Jeff, I see. Do you want to add anything to that? No, I think they both hit it well that uh, we, we fly exactly what we're assigned to do. We, we, we come out of a uh, world port at the end of the ramp and we get direction from ground on which runway we're going to go to. The only time that we might have a specific uh, request of a runway is, is for the larger aircraft need longer runways to, to get that speed to be able to get into the air. And that's the only time we might have an operational requirement to have one run, one runway over another. So that's the only thing I'd add. Okay, great. I, th I think that covered it. So I thanks for the teamwork on that one. I'm going to keep us moving. Okay, if someone wants to make a noise complaint, how do they do that? Uh, Natalie, I may tag team with you on this one. Just from an FAA perspective, our office handles uh, some noise complaints, but I know the airport has a noise office as well. Do you, you want to go first? I'll, I'll, and I'll go after you. That that sounds great to me. So we have Bob Slattery, who is our manager of environmental programs, is a dedicated staff person for the airport authority to handle those noise complaints or noise questions or people that just want to understand why planes were flying a certain route. Um, and they can call Bob directly. His number is 502-363-8516. Or they can email Bob at Bob, B O B dot slattery, S L A T T E R Y at flylouisville.com. And Bob's great to follow up with people directly. Um, you know, they can provide their address and he can do a little bit of research and help them understand why they were maybe hearing something that they didn't hear the night before or whatnot. Great. Thanks, Natalie. And I, I know the airport is certainly closer to the operation, if you will, than my office. And I actually work out of our Atlanta office. Uh, but nonetheless, for the southern region, the southeast part of the United States, we do take noise complaints and we work to share information about what's going on with community members up in the areas above where they live or work or experience aircraft noise. You can go to faa.gov forward slant noise, and there's a lot of information about um, about aviation noise and efforts that we have underway, efforts that we have with aircraft and engines, work that we've done for decades. And there's also a place there that you can enter a noise complaint. We have a chat bot that provides some additional information uh, based on the questions. And if we have information available, that's often a great resource as well. So thank you. Um, I think we covered that one. The next question is, why do airplanes diverge on the west runway when they're departing to the south? I don't see another airplane in the sky, yet aircraft are diverging to the west. Jeffrey Chester, do you do you want to address that? I, I can start that, I think. Um, we have uh, specific separation standards for safety here in the FAA, and uh, we uh, do our, well, we meet those. I'm not even going to say we do our best. We meet those every day. It's, it's part of our job and our function. And while you may not be able to see an aircraft uh, nearby, that doesn't mean that there's not one either there or one coming. Um, a lot of those turns you see diverging uh, almost immediately off the runway or shortly thereafter are by design and allow uh, both runways to operate at full capacity. Um, Christian, I think you might have uh, maybe a better explanation or maybe something to add to that. 
Yeah, thank, no, I think that's good, Jeff. Actually, I think that part of the issue is exactly what you said is there's probably more than meets the eye, to be honest. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, our procedures aren't approached in a willy nilly perspective. There's there's a plan, there's a system in place. And sometimes it's also best for the pilots to know exactly what they're going to get. So if they get to the runway, and there could be some variability, it might seem like that's a good idea. But for the controller, it's not for the pilot, it's not ultimately for the folks on board the aircraft. It's not always packages we're talking about that come out of Louisville. Uh, it's a it's a fair amount of passengers as well. So that consistency of knowing what to expect is very important. Uh, Jeff, I Kozak, I think maybe you might echo that too. Uh, just getting to the runway, knowing exactly what you're going to expect, and and then understanding that there are conflicts that not everybody can always see. Yeah, I, I would just echo what you said, Chris. Any change that happens to us close to taking the runway uh, requires a lot of uh, inputs into our our flight management computer um, and the, just delays the whole system as well. So we, we do uh, like it when we get to the end of the runway, knowing exactly what we're going to do. All right. We, hopefully we answered that. Appreciate the, the questions that, that keep coming and thanks, thanks to the panelists for help uh, getting information out to our attendees today. Next question, who requested the proposed change and why does UPS get the requested change that benefits them? I, I was and am a resident before the UPS airport hub moved here. All right, so maybe we'll tag team on that one. Um, Christian, do you, do you have some thoughts on that to start out? Well, there's a lot of moving parts there. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, I can assure, Folks, it wasn't just UPS. It wasn't just the airlines. There's a combination of trying to improve things for the community based on flight tracks, for air traffic controllers based on the procedures that we use, for the airlines and how they're affected, for not just our facility, but for facilities out and beyond ours. I mean, we're talking aircraft that come from not only LA or New York, but Canada, Mexico, flights that come from Germany. So a lot of factors at play that went kind of across the NAS. I think that's, uh, uh, if I get it right, uh, I don't dabble in this stuff too much. The flight uh, procedures gateway, it's a public website. Uh, a lot of the requests go through them. Uh, so not, not just a local issue, kind of a, a, a much bigger picture at play in that. And I, I can add a little bit. I, I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in, but certainly this type of project isn't unique to Louisville. We as the FAA are looking to modernize our procedures across the country. We have a... Our mission is safety and efficiency of the the national airspace system. So that's that's what we do each and every day. Uh, these procedures have a definite safety benefit. The ones we're proposing in terms of procedural separation, keeping aircraft um, separated from each other. As you heard in the answer to the last question, keeping our air traffic controllers and the pilots and actually the equipment on board the aircraft all with a, a common picture of what's going to happen with that flight. Um, so it, this is not unique to, as you said, Christian, not unique to one airline, not unique to one airport. Um, actually, it's it's an FAA proposed project. We we own this one, but when you when we implement a project at an airport, we certainly want to communicate with the primary users of that, and that that would include UPS. Greg, I see you off mute. Did you want to add anything? Thanks, I do, actually. So the other thing to note is that all the airlines that fly into and out of Louisville will benefit from these procedures. It's not just UPS. These are going to be published and widely used. They're going to leverage the new technologies that have been developed since uh, the time that UPS established their hub here in Louisville. So there's a lot of uh, changes and evolution in the industry. Uh, UPS's fleet has improved and modernized, and so uh, so have the other airlines. So this is just a way to uh, to take advantage of those, those advances. Jeffrey? Yeah, I, and I would add, I think uh, you say it's an FAA project, and it absolutely is. Uh, with Louisville uh, SDF really becoming a major player across the NAS, uh, it's almost, I would say, almost unfair to not upgrade their system. Technology changes, and as it changes, we need to take advantage of that. And uh, we've taken advantage of that in, in Columbus, Ohio, and in Indianapolis. Uh, we're working to take advantage of that in Cincinnati and, and, you know, 
Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Detroit, um, all of these places have taken advantage of these technological advances or are, or are in the process of it. So taking advantage here um, saves every airline fuel. Um, it's better for the environment. It's safer across the board. Uh, and to not bring this to Louisville would be doing a disservice to the community, honestly, and everybody that flies in and out of uh, the SDF airport. All right, thank you, Jeffrey. Looking to see if anybody else wants to add. Uh, several of you already chimed in. Okay, let me let me continue. The next question asks: uh, Has the flight path changed over Louisville? Maybe I'm inserting, but has it already changed? Has the flight path changed recently over Louisville? I've lived in Germantown since 2007 but I only began hearing loud airplane noise at night in August of this year. Uh, during the day, I see and hear airplanes flying very low over our neighborhood, typically departing northward. All of this is new. Um, Greg Petto, do you mind, you mind starting us out with that one? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, the It's important to note that these proposed procedures are are not currently in place. So to answer the question, uh, there has been no change in flight procedures for probably over a decade here in Louisville. Um, and I live very close to Germantown, so I can relate to uh, hearing noise more on some evenings than others. Um, one of the things that will drive that is uh, runway use. So if the winds force us to depart north, or if we have airport construction um, that forces a closure of the west runway, then the east runway will see a little bit more volume. And that airplane noise is a little bit more uh, likely to be heard in Germantown. So that may be why you had just noticed it in August of this year, there was no change, but thunderstorms in the area can force us to depart aircraft uh, on, a, on a heading off the airport so that they can avoid that the, the risk of flying into the storm. And, and that's another thing that can cause that. All right. Thanks, Greg. Christian? Yeah, I don't mind jumping in on that just to make the point that I think we saw in the video that we are growing, right? This airport is becoming bigger. And while we we saw, which is one of the reasons that this became such an important thing for us, is this was not a uh, an effort to, to work out just what we're doing currently, but to kind of future-proof the operations as we go with the expectation that we could see more passenger traffic, we could see more general aviation traffic, we could certainly see the possibility that UPS continues to grow. And so that's really what uh, is kind of driving this is that future proof. And I think the the idea that uh, the air, maybe what's being experienced is uh, just the growth, the growth of the airport uh, that we're seeing more aircraft, more things going on. But I think there are some of the other variables at play that Greg brought up that uh, could play into effect. But but again, the goal of this is to take away some of these uh, obstacles, you know, monkey wrenches, whatever you want to call them to the current procedures and improve. So I guess what we'd be asking the community to do is just, you know, let us let us lay these out and play these out. Certainly a lot of thought has gone into them, a lot of effort. And uh, we certainly believe that we're headed in the right direction. And some of these concerns may be alleviated when we when we finally get this going. Michael, Thanks, if Christian. I could just add one, if I could just Please, add one thing. Um, we got to remember what uh, COVID did to the air transportation network. Um, a lot of uh, passenger airlines weren't flying at all uh, for for quite a bit, and then they slowly came back in. So that would probably that could lead you to believe that traffic has increased quite a bit, but it's really kind of just resumed to normal levels and probably increasing from there. Good point. Thanks, Jeff. And that may be an opportunity for me here, just because we're talking about have essentially have these been implemented or these have not, these proposed procedures have not, but I'll, I'll go ahead and share. Uh, as we heard in the introductory video, we're accepting comments uh, from the public. We'll be doing that between now and December 22nd. Those will all be evaluated before the procedures are finalized. The environmental study is finalized and then um, anticipating that the project moves forward in some form, perhaps with adjustments, we'll, we'll work to finalize the procedures and coordinate with industry for their use. I wouldn't expect that to happen before the July timeframe. I think I have that about right, but middle of, middle of 2024, roughly. 
So uh, if you're seeing something now or between now and that time frame, it's it's not this project. It's just how the air traffic operations are are being handled at the airport. All right. Now, good questions. Let's keep those going. Uh, here's a question. I'm a renter in uh, 40217 outside of the area designated for the window replacement. What is the procedure to test if eligible? Uh, I guess if if I'm eligible or or if I'm eligible for consideration, what does the test involve? How does a daytime test, for example, note what it sounds like at 5 a.m. on a certain unpredictable day? Um, my landlord is amenable to the test, but curious how it works. Thank you so much. It's so terribly, terribly loud at times. I cannot enjoy the deck and nice weather at certain times as it's too loud to hear one another speak. At other times, the sound will wake me up and wreaks havoc on the nerves due to the sheer volume. Again, when will this happen? It is unpredictable. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to jump in on that. <laughs> In my opinion, a little bit out of scope of the proposed change, but um, Natalie, do you want to start with a response? Sure, sure. Thank you. So uh, we understand, obviously, for those neighbors that live near SDF, that aircraft noise um, continues to be a concern of theirs, and they they obviously deal with it on, on a daily basis. So that's why we have these noise mitigation programs in place, including our quieter home program, um, our, our voluntary relocation program we previously had. Um, so these are things that we're doing to try to be a good neighbor, to be a good steward in the community, to help folks out. Um, if someone is wanting information on our quieter home program, they can contact contact Bob Slattery. Uh, again, his phone number is 502-363-8516. Or they can contact our Quieter Home Program Manager directly at 502-636-2448. And either of those folks would be able to get them in touch with the right people or be able to kind of walk through that process to understand how it works and how that testing goes. Um, obviously, those programs are based on the guidance that we have as part of our Part 150 standing and airport noise compatibility planning. So um, we definitely would be happy to have that conversation with them individually, even though it goes a little bit beyond about what we're talking about tonight or this afternoon. Um, be happy to answer those questions specifically. All right. That's great. Thanks so much, Natalie. And I don't know that there's anything else to add to that. So hopefully we addressed uh, where they can get some additional information on that aspect. I'll move on. Uh, the next question, why is the new proposal on the Southwest runway 17 right showing a five, I'm sorry, excuse me, showing a 15 to 20 degree bank for departure during the early morning hours? Um, Christian, I, I'll just remind we we could pull up uh, charts or boards if if that would be helpful with this. But um, Christian, do you do you want to start with that one? Well, sure. I can I can at least get it started. Uh, I think the simplest way to put it is just rules. I mean, we've all I think when we're arriving and we have two aircraft coming into a parallel runway, we've all looked over and kind of seen somebody right off our window out here, and it can be a little unnerving when you're arriving. But at least there's kind of a controlled. Uh, descent into the airport for departures, uh, the FAA doesn't want that system to go on as long. So they want to kind of pull those aircraft apart. So rather than having aircraft come off parallel runway side by side and track out, they want to create what's what we call divergence. And so uh, whether vectors initiated by a controller or procedures like we're working on right now, there's a little bit of straight out. And then we begin to turn away uh, in ways that uh, pull the aircraft apart steadily. And, and back to what I mentioned before about that variability uh, we didn't want the pilot showing up to the runway and thinking, well, sometimes it's this and sometimes it's this. So determinations were made off the east runways. Those aircraft go straight out, which makes the west runways our kind of diverging runways where we come off and begin that peel apart process. So uh, obviously to the southwest, the restricted area down at uh, uh, the Gobner Army Airfield can come into play sometimes. So we, we have to consider that a little bit and uh, some other factors. I think, Greg, jump in with me if I'm forgetting something here. I'm sure I, I am, but I think no. for me, the basic answer would be the rules. 
Yeah, you're doing great. The first one is the rules. The other one is that the uh, the restricted airspace at Fort Knox uh, is uh, a, a large uh, area of airspace that sometimes uh, we have to avoid for uh, military activity. And so the uh, divergence off that runway is designed to not only give us our legal separation for those successive departures, but also to provide that separation uh, uh, in a guaranteed and consistent way so that we never have to worry about it. Okay. Hey. Uh, thank you. Thank you both, Christian and Greg, for that. I'm going to keep us rolling. Given the next question, given the flight paths indicated, I know some pilots request to veer from the assigned path. When they do this, it can have significant noise impacts for residents. What will be in place to ensure pilots stay on the assigned path? Greg, do you? I know you were just up, but <laughs> no, no problem. So I, I will say that uh, the pilots like to know what they're doing and they don't necessarily like a lot of change. So um, if they were to veer from their path uh, that they're assigned, uh, it would be for some good reason, like uh, weather ahead or uh, maybe they see something that they want to avoid. Uh, you know, and so that's our job is to ensure that uh, the separation is guaranteed. Um, so if we take an aircraft off the proceed off the procedure, it's for sequencing, it's for spacing, it's for separation, it's generally for safety. Uh, so that you know, unfortunately, when you, when you take an aircraft off one of these published routes, somebody who maybe doesn't live under that route, they may hear a little bit more noise or see an airplane where they normally wouldn't. Um, and uh, that's just unfortunately nature of the beast. You know, we we do what we can to ensure the safety, and uh, but generally speaking, there's. There's a good reason for that, traffic, weather, or, or some sort of flight restriction. Christian, did you have anything you might wanna add? Yeah, I would just expand on that a little bit because I think it's a little bit about perspective too. For the person on the ground who is looking at that aircraft, maybe deviate, and as you mentioned, I think you read rightfully so, that those things don't just happen. I mean, there's, there's a reason for them because they're in everybody's best interest for it to stay as planned, let's say. But if you're the person on the ground and the aircraft is flying, uh, in a way that doesn't seem normal, that can be frustrating. I, I would kind of flip it around to say, if you have your uh, child who's getting ready to go back to college and they're flying back on that airplane and there's major thunderstorms to the south, then you want that aircraft to turn and not fly into that path. So some of that flexibility that we bring in uh, in these moments can really help help that process. So uh, nothing happens without a reason. It doesn't happen just because there is a plan for it. And I would say that you know, realistically, when it happens, it's for a good reason. I think if the person uh, on the ground who was witnessing it kind of saw that full picture, they, they'd probably be much more comfortable with that uh, deviation. Yeah. And if I can follow up on that, Christian, you know, a couple of the other things that I think uh, the community is not always aware of that we're, uh, that we're responsible for would be separation of uh, helicopters going into the hospitals downtown. So sometimes, you know, we try and, uh, give them priority when uh, they have a patient on board that needs medical treatment. So um, that would result in an aircraft maybe being vectored a little bit out of the way to ensure that the helicopter could land safely. Also, law enforcement uh, activities. Sometimes we have, uh, we just had one the other day, there was a, a carjacking and the uh, Louisville Metro Police was uh, was following that vehicle for their ground units. Uh, so we had to route some aircraft around that and, and the police were very thankful for our services afterwards because that allowed them to provide the support that they needed. So there's always a good reason for those deviations. Michael, uh, Captain you. Jeff, please do. I was gonna ask if you had anything to add. Yeah, I, I can assure the, the person who asked the last question is there's no pilot that does something without clearance from the air traffic control. We have a, a very uh, tight contract with them. They don't want us to do something they're not expecting, and we certainly don't want to be doing something we're not expecting. Um, and the from takeoff, from taking the runway, so you're completely cleaned up and climbing out on speed is a very high workload environment. And we are not thinking about deviating from a uh, course or anything else because of that workload. Um, any Anytime you get out of that habit pattern, you tend to make mistakes. And so we're, we're very regimented. We test pilots in the simulator on this all the time. So I can, I can assure the, the person with the last question, it's not something a pilot decides to do. 
Jeffrey. I if I could just add one thing, and I think uh, back to the uh, original question, since I know some pilots request a veer from the assigned path, I think I think that's what you said. That um, the way these procedures are designed, the arrivals and departures, it is in everyone's best interest if they can stay on the path and on on schedule because they are procedurally separated from each other. The arrivals and departures will come in um, and the controllers and the airlines do not have to worry about the other aircraft in the airspace. They're already by design, if uh, everybody can stay on path, uh, separated in a safe and efficient manner. Uh, so while today all of those aircraft are, or most of those aircraft get vectored uh, to the appropriate locations, the new procedures will allow them to fly uh, essentially what they were being vectored for uh, on schedule, on time, every time. Uh, now, obviously, you've heard all the reasons why they might have to be moved and what possibly could happen. But by schedule and by design, uh, less aircraft will be vectored. I definitely agreed. All right. I think we're good on that one. I, again, I want to take just a moment and thank all of our participants for uh, submitting questions. Please, please keep sending those in on on through Zoom or through the YouTube links, and uh, we're working on answering those, getting through them as quickly as we can. So I'm going to keep us moving by going to the next question. How how do we find out how the new procedures will affect individual neighborhoods? in terms of nighttime noise. Um, Greg, Gregory, do you want to start that? Sure, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Uh, that's actually a pretty good question. Um, as we uh, indicated earlier in the previous uh, um, question, uh, the environmental analysis for this proposed uh, project is, is still ongoing. Uh, we've actually, we have completed the uh, the noise analysis was mentioned also in answer to a previous question, and we didn't have any significant impact or reportable quantity, of what we, which is considered at the lowest end of the spectrum uh, during that time. For us to really get a good feel for how we're looking uh, relative to uh, any noise, you know, noise as it stands as right now is, is kind of like what Michael said previously, when the procedures are turned on post implementation after July of 2024, um, as the procedures are being used by uh, the the airlines, and then the community themselves will get you know will be able to kind of see if there's any type of impact. And at that particular time, there's a process uh, thing uh, as well as uh, from us from FAA to submit NORS uh, complaints if you have any, as well as uh, through Bob um, at the airport. And then those particular uh, comments, um, excuse me, uh, complaints, if you will, if there's any NORS complaints, will be evaluated uh, to see if there's any impact from the procedure. So that really gives us a good idea, a better, or overall better indication how things will be after uh, when we get to post implementation prior to asking, you know, the question is asked now, we won't have a real good feel until after that's completed. So I would say after when we get to post implementation, we'll have a better idea if there's any issues. But uh, just to reiterate, uh, we didn't have any significant or reportable quantities during the noise analysis, which is one portion of the, the quite a few of the impact categories that we view that we reviewed during this process. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Gregory. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to add anything to it. The only thing I would say in terms of areas or neighborhoods, again, the, this video includes all the information that you saw at the start with the boards, uh, the altitudes that are color coded, you know, that might help say, how does, how does this proposed procedure uh, affect the areas where I live? You know, what am I seeing now and what might I see in the future and, and how high will they be? So I think that ties in with Gregory's answer. Okay, so there's a next question. What impact will this, uh, these proposed procedures have on Clark Regional or Bowman Field in terms of, of their flow? Uh, Christian, do you, do you wanna answer that or help me tap somebody? <laughs> Uh, no, I'll get started on that. That's a kind of a, a multi-layer question. I'll try to be brief. So the Clark County Airport, the Clark Regional Airport is an uncontrolled airport. So what happens over there is kind of just the pilots 
doing the best they can, talking to each other on a, on a Unicom frequency. At Bowman, uh, a controlled airport uh, within their little surface area there uh, for departures in, off of Clark County and departures off Bowman, there'll be no change. That's kind of, uh, that's going to be as it is. There, there weren't really uh, changes to that at all. Uh, for arrivals coming in, for the community standpoint, no no change to be no noticed there because things are happening much farther out and at higher altitudes. Uh, for the pilots, uh, they will get a transition into those airports. There are the procedures do allow for an accommodation into those airports. So when they check in, there'll be a flight path that's built for them, complete with altitudes and waypoints and all that. So more consistent for them as well, and better for the controllers, frankly, because a lot of times uh, as we begin this mix that we talking about what uh, Captain Kozak was talking about earlier. We have 747-800s here, and we have aircraft that hold two folks who are coming back from a you know a meal in St. Louis or whatever. So a lot of variability here that we're dealing with and the way these procedures are set up is to help pull them apart, give a little cleaner flight path, keep aircraft away from each other, uh, but still get an efficient track into the, into the airport. But for departures and stuff around the immediate airports, uh, that's not changed and really not under our control. That makes yeah, sense. And Greg, I, I mean, am I forgetting some there? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you on all of them because uh, you've been here. Yeah, long. I've been in Clark County, the complex for us, the controllers. Uh, it, it's it's two airports that are very close in proximity to the primary airport here at SDF. Uh, so it poses its own set of challenges. But the, these procedures will not, I mean, if anything, they make things more efficient for uh, aircraft flying instrument flight rules uh, on their way into those airports. That's that's kind of what we're expecting. But for the most part, those uh, flight paths that they can expect to fly are the same ones that we've been shortcutting them over for year after year. OK. So is it is it accurate, Greg or Christian, you can you can help me out with this, but it's accurate to I'm not supposed to ask questions, I know, but I'm <laughs> trying to help with an answer. I know you mentioned uh, the pilots at the other the other two airports, Christian, so that sometimes a pilot's operating under sea and avoid, which is quite a bit different than being on a, an established procedure. So that almost the nature of the airspace they're operating in is a bit different in a I, I just want the viewers or listeners to understand that sometimes aircraft are required to be working with air traffic control and other times it's more of what we call see it, see and avoid or, or visual flight rules. Uh, please feel free to touch on that as it may be relevant. I certainly don't want to share anything inaccurate. No, I think that's right. I think the thing about the pilots, we haven't really touched on this. It was kind of in the video. We haven't got to discuss this point, but for the aircraft that come into this airspace, um, instead of now having a heading assigned, an altitude assigned, maybe another heading assigned, another altitude assigned, another altitude assigned, now a lot of that's just built in the procedure. So we looked at how can we best get aircraft from the start of the airspace to where they want to go and what altitudes can we accommodate that at? And we just built the procedures to do that. Now, there still lies some flexibility in that where the controllers can look at certain times and see I've got some circumstances at play where I might be able to do something different. But by and large, for the for the pilots that come into the airspace, and as you mentioned, obviously, Stanford, but also Clark County and Bowman, those procedures will allow those aircraft to just kind of fly themselves really to, to the best to the best location. So, yeah, but as you mentioned, people that are kind of in the scene of void world, that won't change for them. They'll still have to be looking for things. But and I would encourage as we go through this that the pilots uh, at those airports, familiarize themselves with these changes. There's been a lot of us, a lot of things happened here for a long time the same way. And for everybody involved, these will be some uh, some big changes. So as we move into this, I hope the pilots that are going in and out of those airports take the time to really review those procedures carefully. All right, very good. And uh, Greg Petto, I'm going to ask your your uh, a little bit of grace on this, but uh, I'm actually going to take a question a little bit out of out of order. But I think it's one we can roll right in here with a quick answer. But are there any planned changes to to the Class C or the Charlie airspace dimensions as a result of this project? So no, uh, there will be no changes to the dimensions of the Class C uh, controlled airspace. Uh, but it is important for the community to know that. You know, when we talk about airspace, there are two ways I like to explain it. One, there's the controlled airspace, which is the charted Class C airspace here at SDF. Uh, and also Bowman 
has a class Delta airspace that is centered over their airport. It's tucked in just under the outer ring of the SDF airspace. The SDF airspace is, consists of a five mile inner ring and a five mile outer ring. It's kind of like a like a wedding cake flipped on its you know upside down. But at SDF, the radar controllers are responsible for the delegated airspace, which extends about 45 miles in all directions. And so we sequence and separate aircraft not only into the primary airports, but into the secondary airports. And also we have about a dozen satellite airports we provide services to. So for somebody who's doing some flying, it's a sunny day, they're doing a sea and avoid, and they don't need to talk to air traffic control necessarily, but we do provide class C radar services in our delegated airspace. And we're happy to do so. We'd rather be talking to these pilots than not. Um, so one of the benefits of these new procedures uh, will be the predictability of all the uh, the routes so that when I am talking to a VFR aircraft that's receiving flight following, um, I know exactly where the safe spots are to direct them so I can keep them out of harm's way, given the fact that 65% of the aircraft that fly into and out of Louisville are heavy jets and they have weight turbulence implications for any aircraft that fly near or underneath them, uh, it's gonna be a, a, a huge improvement for us in, in terms of improving safety for the, uh, the GA community. But the class C airspace will not change at all. Those boundaries will remain the same. All right, very good. It seemed to tie in and I know that was just a question I had. So th thanks for taking that one, Greg. All right, let me move to the next question. With regard to the southbound departures and the turns given to uh, 17 right while 17 left is given a straight center line departure, should, should this be switched given the no-fly and any restrictions related to Fort Knox? Or why does this happen? So... Um, Hopefully I hopefully I think I have that picture, but again, southbound departures and the turns on 17 right, 17 left, straight center. Greg, do you want to start us out with that one? Okay. So that procedure is a long established and 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 long observed procedure that we follow here. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the uh, the need for that is it's driven by the the requirement for us to have the aircraft diverge off of the runway, but also um, it uh, guarantees that our east runway, one seven left departures, can depart straight out. And that is the area that has been uh, subject to the, uh, the airport um, supported relocations. Um, it's been zoned for things uh, for uh, compatible land use. And so that's why those aircraft depart straight out off runway one seven left. And because they do that, off runway 17 right, they'll turn to the southwest, which also gives us a little bit extra room getting around restricted area activities at Fort Knox. Uh, Christian, did you want to tack on anything? Uh, maybe just to add that I think I mentioned earlier uh, that when we depart to the north, uh, aircraft, we have Bowman Airport right off our right. Okay, so aircraft can't turn eastbound there because Bowman owns that and that's their airspace, just like it's your property. Uh, when we depart to the south and turn left, the way the airport is configured is that we have the 2-9 approach path kind of coming in that way. So we would, in a sense, risk turning it. So there kind of got to be a lot of variables at play. And I think ultimately what you you mentioned there, Greg, was uh, a determination was made uh, of what was best. Um, and best is a variable term, uh, of, of course. But we looked at, uh, you know, the, the decision was made was how, how would those impacts best be laid out? And that was the decision. I would say to the point of the range, that is, a, that is a benefit of these procedures right now because we do currently use headings that aim towards the range. It's been a mitigated uh, risk that we've kind of dealt with over the years, but it has been a risk and an identified risk. And these putting every aircraft day and night now on these new procedures, I mean, virtually eliminates that risk to only aircraft that can't fly the procedure. And for those, we have uh, mitigations involved too. But uh, now all those aircraft that depart at night that, will, that won't be on those Currently, they don't fly the procedures, but they will in the future. So we're talking 100, 125 aircraft possibly that will never be affected by that anymore. So that's a real, I'm sure Captain Jeff's happy to never have to worry about flying through an artillery range uh, in his <laughs> flight experience. Not in the civilian airplane. 
Hey, Christian, I just want to add also that um, while uh, there are people that, that live south of the airport, uh, it is lesser populated there um, where those flight tracks are centered. Uh, so it affects the uh, the fewest number of people. And one thing I always like to mention in the noise meetings is, you know, if, um, if you're hearing, if you're not hearing airplane noise, it means somebody else is. You know, and so things things are variable. Um, but uh, yeah, those those procedures have been in place for a long time and and they do ensure safety. Hey, again, thank thanks for the the team effort on that one. I'm just gonna tell you up front, Christian, I need some help with this, but uh, as a G as a GA pilot based at Clark Regional, I've noticed that I'm often uh, rooted over EWO, even when coming from the Southwest, and it would seem more efficient for me to arrive West of the restricted area instead of East. Can you explain uh, the routing reason? So I may start with you, but feel free again to bring others in. Yeah, well, you've come to the right briefing then. I mean, uh, you can see Mr. Chester. Let's let's uh, give a little shout out to Mr. Chester and his team at Indy Center. So for those who don't understand airspace, we have ours and it goes up to a certain amount of altitude. Well, Jeff's group owns the airspace above us and the ability to look at some of these changes and uh, flexibility on these routes that come into the airport has to go through them as well. I mean, it even we have to work it all the way back to Atlanta. What does Atlanta want to do? What does the next sector want to do? But Jeff and his group as the overlying sector have a lot to play into that. So in the future, you will not go over New Hope. You will stay on the Southwest. You will go west of the restricted area. You will basically get the most direct route you can with uh, some flexibility of understanding if there's arrival traffic and departure traffic. But I think that uh, if that's what you're looking for, then you've come to the right place. And uh, thank Mr. Chester and his group for help making that uh, a possibility. So EWO is new. I was going to ask like the acronyms. GA, General Aviation, got it. I know that. EWO, I, is that New Hope? Is that what you were saying? Correct. Yeah, the new it's hope the or the new yep. Neve that uh, we use down Got there, it. and that's that's it. And, okay. and the new procedure. Very good. Yeah. I do that's not have all the VORs memorized, so thanks for thanks for the local knowledge on that one. And Greg Petto. Yeah, sorry to step on you, but that's one of those ground-based navigational aids that we used to rely on uh, primarily for all aircraft navigation. So we do have some scattered throughout the country that we still use. Um, and that's one of the areas that uh, that we still possess one. Um, the one thing I wanna ask Christian though, is the, uh, what if that pilot is VFR? He's not on one of these procedures, then what? Can we still expect uh, him to be able to take that, that path uh, west of the restricted area? Yeah, I don't I'll feel like there's any the restrictions. I, I would I would imagine these days uh, I might be surprised to find someone got vectored in a position, uh, VFR especially, to go on the east side of the range. But uh, yeah, VFR, I don't think you're basically getting direct because the separation standards aren't required. So I think that it's, uh, this shouldn't be affected if they're just a VFR, as Michael alluded to earlier, kind of in that C and avoid mode, flying on their own or maybe under different flight rules than the stuff that uh, Captain Kozak and uh, Southwest and the other airlines fly under. And, you know, for the non-aviation people watching, one of the things to, to mention, though, is that Clark County Airport lies just east of the, the final approach course for runway 17 left and 17 right at Louisville. So we have a high volume of aircraft uh, coming down those final approaches and descending right past that airport when we're landing to the south. So while everyone likes to fly in a straight line, if they can, sometimes a straight line is not always the best path. Uh, so that's one of those things that uh, that we like to caution pilots in our pilot forums uh, about. You know, if you depart Clark County and you climb out due westbound, there are going to be some aircraft uh, potentially uh, there uh, along your flight path. So uh, sometimes when we issue uh, vectors for aircraft, it may seem outside of what you would expect or may seem uh, to be taking you out of the way. It's really to ensure that that separation is safety. Jeffrey, did you have something to add? Yeah, I would just add that, that right now, if you're, uh, if you're coming from the South, the most, the most efficient available option is to come over New Hope. Um, and it, while it certainly doesn't feel like that as a, as a pilot arriving, um, then if you were coming from the Southwest, you would have to come almost over uh, Huntingburg, Indiana. You'd have to be well north of Evansville, uh, Indiana, 
before you could turn in uh, uh, on the current configuration and, and design based on where the inbounds and outbounds uh, fly. Uh, with the new designs, you're going to see, and I think they, uh, they had it on the video up there on the charts, uh, you're going to see more of a southwest corner post arrival, I guess, uh, which would allow somebody coming from the south uh, to be efficiently on that east side of the range and move right, move uh, to Clark County much easier there, much smoother. Okay. I, I, I think we um, switch gears just a little bit, but several of us probably the better, more than half of the panel members that are on the screen now had an opportunity to uh, attend a briefing with the Louisville Community Noise Forum last Thursday evening. And we heard some good questions there, maybe just an opportunity to share a few of those questions with this audience and, and walk through those real quick. Um, I, don't, I don't think they're real, they're very detailed, but um, we've, we've touched on this from the other direction, I think, but one of the questions was why can't there be turns to the east off of the east runway when, when the airport's in a north flow? Uh, Greg, again, I'm not trying to keep a short answer, but I don't, we don't have to necessarily go in depth. I just wanted to touch on some you know, of the I think, questions we got yeah. last week. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So Christian actually touched on this just a, a couple minutes ago. And uh, the reason is that three, five right departures that turn immediately eastbound would run right into Bowman Towers airspace. Uh, and so we have to protect the, uh, the integrity of that class Delta airspace, the class D airspace there. So that's why they climb straight out. Very good. Yeah, it's a different airspace, different uh, kind of a boundary there that's important in aviation. Uh, all right, how high will aircraft be in areas where the departures split into separate procedures uh, to the southeast and the southwest of the airport? And I, I think we were referencing a board that, that depicted that. So if we can maybe pull that up. Greg, again, uh, feel free to jump in on this one if if you don't mind. Hey, Christian, feel free to back me up. But by the time those aircraft hit those divergent points, uh, we're expecting them to be at about uh, what is it, Christian? About ten thousand feet on the profile. Uh, aircraft variability, I think, will come into play on some of that, and I suppose it depends on what fix you're talking about and how far away from the airport you're talking about. But I think uh, um, minimum uh, 6,000 feet, comfortably 10,000, depending on conditions that the aircraft are flying. The highest they can climb through our instruction is 13,000 feet. So, I mean, an aircraft could be, you know, depending on weather conditions, could one day be at 12 and one day be at eight. Now they won't be at three because the, you know, the conditions don't allow for that, but there is some variability, but it's, it's going to be, yes, the six, the eights, the 10,000 foot ranges, depending on the type of aircraft and the weather conditions, I'd say. This might be a good opportunity, Christian, to discuss the benefit of the, uh, the continuous climb that these aircraft will enjoy. Because right now when aircraft depart, uh, we often have to level those aircraft. That means uh, giving them an assigned altitude uh, initially rather than let them continue their climb. Uh, so once those aircraft level, it's uh, it's to get them on course. Sometimes we have to make a choice, get them on course or get them higher up because our arrivals are coming in and we have to segregate those arrival and departures. Uh, so these procedures are designed to separate the aircraft that are arriving from the aircraft that are departing uh, vertically or laterally um, just by virtue of the procedure themselves. So this is another benefit that uh, those aircraft will be able to continue their climb, get higher and, and further away from the airport uh, rather than level and constantly having power uh, inputs and, and, and creating more noise. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think maybe... Jeff Kozak, if you want to speak to, uh, you know, the fact that you're allowed to go higher on departure doesn't necessarily mean you'll be, you know, taken off like an F-16 trying to go straight to uh, the flight levels. I mean, there's still a, a control level of climb that you want to have. It just allows you to have a little more consistent go. 
uh, now I think that's going to be better for you guys. Maybe you speak to that better. No, absolutely, Christian. The, the, the longer we can just hold a steady climb, the, the more, um, the less noise, obviously, that you guys covered because we'll be further away from the ground and it's much more efficient, um, fuel efficient. And then from a carbon emissions, it reduces that as well. So it's, it's really a win. And like, you, and like, uh, Greg was state, you both said the ceiling of, uh, Louisville airspace now will be 13,000 feet instead of 10, which allows us a much more efficient climb away from the ground and less level offs. And the other part is, is when we tested this in the simulator, you deconflicted the arrival and departure corridors so that we're not vectoring, deconflicting aircraft on vectors. Uh, now it'll just be routine. Um, there'll be uh, regular routes. So uh, again, it's another win for, uh, for the airspace redesign, the community, and for uh, all the airlines that are flying into Louisville. Very good. We may keep the diagram up for this next question. I didn't ask for that quite fast enough, but it's a basic question. Are the are the procedures selected based on the aircraft destination? I just thought having the the background seems appropriate for this one as well. But um, Christian or Greg. You don't have to use the diagram, but I, you can kind of see different areas and directions that aircraft would be departing. To you. Sure. So I think in, in this case, there, there's again a lot of factors, which is I, I don't, I think neither Greg or I would want to overhype the air traffic part of it and how complicated it is, but it's complicated, right? There's a lot of factors at play. That's what makes the job what it is. We have runway closures. We have runway uh, scheduled outages. There's a big planes here landing. So uh, you have factors at that that the community might not even think about. So uh, ideally, it's easiest when an aircraft who, that is going westbound gets the west runway and uh, vice versa for eastbound. But there are a lot of factors at play, as we talked about. I've, I've looked out on the west side of the airport when we were departing to the south and watched a cloud of rain just approach and approach and approach from the west. And I watched the west runway disappear in that rainstorm while aircraft took off 17 left as quick as they could to get out of the way. Ideally, in that case, you know, they were going westbound. They should have been on the west runway. But obviously, the nature of that uh, pretty strong thunderstorm necessitated the use of the east runway. So a lot of factors at play for that, a lot of things that come, uh, uh, as I said, come into play to make those decisions. But ideally, yes, it's a very often best west for west, east for east kind of configuration. Greg, am I forgetting something there? Nothing to add, Christian. Nicely done. So I'm going to I'm going to add something again when I speak. Again, I'm going to invite clarification if you all want. But one of the things you can see on the chart, for example, the, the destinations to the north, just as Christian was explaining, you can see that you can get there off the east runway and making the turn. Those procedure names you see in the upper right corner are the same procedure names on the, the up, upper left corner. Uh, so you can es essentially get there either way. And you'll notice that there's even a crossover kind of south of the airport where you can get from either runway to points to the southeast. So, yes, I think, Christian, as you indicated, ideally, there are ways that it's it's preferred to operate the flow, but part of the project connects both the runways, uh, so those options are available. And, and again, we have the benefit of procedural separation. So hopefully I said that accurately. No, it, it, that's that's actually excellent. And I'm embarrassed as the air traffic controller who works there that I didn't think of the, that point, that the fact is that now aircraft that come off 17 left that are turning westbound uh, might have to wait. They they currently would have had to wait because there's uh, six UPS aircraft over on 17 right that are waiting to depart westbound. And now if that aircraft's going to depart to the north or to the south, they don't have to wait anymore. So when they get to the runway, they can go. And I think that was one of the real benefits that we looked at is how can we get, um, you know, honoring the current noise tracks that we have now, how can we get to a point that we can get more aircraft out of the airspace and on their way quicker? I, I think if you don't mind me adding in, gentlemen, I think the, the destination may determine uh, which route they're gonna take there where you see Eva or, or Lockhart or Spiller or uh, those, uh, but not necessarily determine the runway anymore, where it used to have to determine the runway as well. Uh, there are options. I think it's what you're trying to say, Christian, is 
yes, the, the destination. If you're gonna if you're gonna go to the north, you're you're not going out Eva, right? You're gonna go out Roadhouse. You're gonna go out Spiller, uh, but you can go get there from either runway, and so that's gonna be an important improvement, significant improvement, or for the operations there. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Uh, quick question, will this information be available online? So again, this, this entire workshops from start to finish is being recorded. It will be uh, the easiest way to get to it. It'll be on the FA's YouTube channel um, and it'll be available essentially right at the conclusion of the meeting. Uh, it's actually streaming live there now, uh, but you can come back and watch it later today or later in the week, and we won't be deleting it anytime soon. So the project video or the workshop video will remain active both from uh, this afternoon session as well as the, the subsequent workshop that we're hosting Thursday night at 6 Eastern. Okay, here's one. We, we touched on the words arrival uh, versus approach, or we used both words. What, what's the difference? Do we mean a difference when we use those? Uh, Jeffrey, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I'll start with that. And I think probably some of the folks that have been asking questions uh, understand that given the technical nature of the questions we've seen, which uh, has been great. But for a lot of other folks out there, um, those words seem to intermix and, and be used, you know, interchanged. And they're not really. Uh, standard terminal arrival route is a route that's going to take an aircraft from uh, when your pilot says, oh, we're going to be cruising at 35,000 feet today, right? It's going to take that aircraft from 35,000 feet down well inside uh, Louisville Approaches airspace, as Greg's already alluded to what that is, about 45 miles from the airport, and take it down right to uh, at or near the runway. Um, and I think it kind of sounds silly, but the best way I can describe it, and I've described it this way for so long, it's kind of funny, but when you go grocery shopping and you, you get in the store and you're, you're wandering around, you find everything you want, you decide, okay, that's it, I'm leaving, right? Well, now you're on approach and you, you may not be anywhere near the checkout, right? You might be over Columbus, Ohio, trying to land it at uh, Louisville, but you're on approach, right? And you take a very specific path path in this case, uh, very well designed um, and with very limited communication from the controllers because of the design of this. And it takes you all the way down right up to where you get to that checkout line, right up to where maybe you're four or five miles from the airport, right? That's really when you're on arrival, right? When you're, when you're looking down and you're seeing, you're seeing the, the ground speed up beneath you, even though it's not really, but it's sure sure looks that way. I know that optical illusion, um, that's when you're on, you're there, right? So that's, that's the difference. And you know, from a commercial, on a commercial there. airline flight, Jeffrey, uh, I, I kind of think of it as when the, the captain comes on and says, ladies and gentlemen, we've begun our initial approach. I mean, you, you still may fly another 20, 25 minutes, uh, you, you may be 100 miles out from the airport, literally when that announcement's made. But when you see the flight attendants sit down, you're on approach. <laughs> it may not be perfect, but, you know, from what you've seen on board the aircraft, that's probably a good analogy. Absolutely. All right. Um, all right. The next question, the video showed how the runways are used to reduce noise over certain areas. Can can you review that again? Um, I don't know who wants to jump in on that one. I'll jump in on that one. Can we bring up the, uh, well, I guess, uh, let's see, is there a board that might illustrate this? Okay, so this is the uh, south arrivals. So one of the things that that the control tower does is uh, we try and and operate in a way to reduce the noise over the more populated parts of the community, depending on the time of day. Uh, so we typically operate in what's called a contraflow operation, 
Um, and we regularly change the runways to decrease the traffic volume over those areas, uh, as long as the weather and the winds are allow us to do that. Uh, so that's why you may see airplanes land one direction during the morning and in the afternoon, they're going a different direction. And that's all related to that. Uh, so that's part of our, our, uh, our noise abatement agreement that we have with the airport authority to be good neighbors. Uh, a lot of us live near the airport. And so, you know, we, we like quiet neighborhoods as well. Uh, so that's the reason why we we change the directions. So that may be what that that person asking that question is talking about. Thank you, Greg. I don't know if there's any aspect on the noise abatement activity that would be relevant, um, either from FAA or the airport. Anybody want to add to that? Uh, Michael, I might just throw in that we're we're committed to it. I think Greg made a lot of good points there. Uh, you know, it's not uh, in the briefing. We kind of mentioned the times that we changed, where it's uh, three a.m. to nine and and nine to two, and we kind of do those jumps. Those those are not terribly convenient things for the air traffic controllers. And I don't want to sit here and whine about it, but you know, there's it it is not easy to take an entire operation and turn it the other way, especially at some of these times during the middle of the day. And but we do it. And we do it because it's a commitment that we made uh, to the community. So we look at these little breaks where we see we don't have visit. We kind of know when we want to make the changes. We see these opportunities. We swing everything around. Uh, equipment systems have to be turned around. Maps have to be turned around. Uh, some of the communication stuff where people have to be assigned different frequencies and stuff turn around. And then we just kind of pick up and, and we do it in a nice, smooth, orderly transition. But uh, if you're a pilot coming in right then who's listening to the information broadcast about how, what runway you're going to land on, and you're pre-briefing and you're expecting for a certain runway and then we have to change it. Uh, it's not easy, but they understand. And certainly UPS is one of our primary users understands that that's just what we're going to do as, as we live here is take on those inconveniences because we understand the, uh, the impact that's being had to the community. Yeah. If I could just elaborate on that a little bit, the, the contra flow program that we operate at night uh, focuses is on a preference of a uh, landing to the north uh, during the inbound push, which is uh, usually from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. And then uh, for the departure push later in the morning, uh, we try and turn around to uh, depart off 17 left and 17 right, so depart to the south. So that's the contra flow. And then the uh, reverse flow program is what we employ during the daytime hours. And we change that uh, based on demand. When there's more arrivals to the airport than there are departures, we know that we can uh, turn the airport to, to land them, again, wind and weather permitting, so that uh, we can impact the fewest number of people with, with that aircraft noise. Uh, in fact, it, we're held accountable if we don't. Uh, if we forget to switch or if we're late switching the direction of traffic, we have to explain why. Uh, we have a daily log of operations that that, uh, that we keep track of things and uh, the airport authority um, and Bob Slattery, it, the, the noise officer there, he'll, he'll ask, hey, why, why were we late on that turn? And, you know, sometimes it's because we uh, just we're uh, trying to recover some extra airplanes that we didn't account for, or there might be a weather situation. But, you know, we definitely are held accountable to that. All right, great. Thank you. All right, the next question, what will, what will the new projected noise level be from the west runway, south departure and arrivals? Uh, this is someone uh, presumably in the Yorktown uh, there's a residential area, Yorktown North, one mile west of the 17 right runway. Um, so part of that's environmental, Greg. Uh, you're well, Gregory, feel free to jump in if you need any of the local local geographic expertise. Feel free to call on uh, call on, call for help. Phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, <clears throat> Uh, night time, thank you for the question. Nighttime operations uh, should move further to the east of Yorktown. Uh, no, I'm sorry, east of Yorktown, north than they are, you know, than they are currently. However, the environmental review, as we mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, is ongoing. Um, there were no uh, reportable quantities in the initial environmental review uh, that you know changes that we that we have already accomplished so far during this process. Um, can we pull up board number number twelve and probably uh, maybe I can get either Greg or Christian to maybe elaborate a little bit more on uh, the area of Yorktown that the citizen was asking, referring to in this particular question.
Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, thanks, Gregory. So the what that board is showing is uh, the the flight tracks are the, uh, the the thinner colored lines and the various colors. And off runway one seven right when those when those uh, flight tracks turn early, it'll show a little bit more of a dispersal or a fanning effect. Uh, and so one thing that these procedures are intended to do is set up the uh, the airport so that we're using the same procedures daytime and nighttime. And that's why there's such a focus in that video on daytime hours and nighttime hours and, and what constituted what. Uh, so right now, as it stands, we do have uh, RNAV, uh, like GPS-based procedures in place during the day. So that when aircraft depart, they fly a prescribed route. Uh, as long as there's no other mitigating factors, again, Let's talk about thunderstorms, military activity, that sort of thing. Um, but during the midnight hours and the early morning hours, uh, when those aircraft depart, they are assigned headings off the ground. And so those headings are affected, uh, sorry, those flight tracks that will be affected by wind uh, or when the turn begins. And every aircraft has its own performance uh, characteristics. I won't speak to that. I don't have a lot of hours in the cockpit. But uh, so depending on that, on those, those varying factors, you'll see different tracks for every aircraft. Uh, but what we're uh, expecting with the new procedures is that those flight tracks will be more predictable. And uh, the people who live just southwest of the airport in Yorktown North won't see those early turns anymore unless there is a absolute necessary reason. Because, I, I, again, like uh, Captain Kozak mentioned, you know, pilots like to fly what they're supposed to fly. And any surprises you throw, throw at them, it's, uh, you know, they can handle it but it does add to the workload and, and the unpredictability. Christian, do you have anything? Yeah, I think this is a great example. Of, it's, a, it's a good board to show kind of how the, uh, the consistency of the departures will play out as we go. But I think there's actually a better slide that shows kind of the uh, inconsistency. I'm not sure. It's probably in the nighttime south flow departures uh, map. And I'm not sure how easily we can transition to that. If we can do that right now, maybe, or maybe we can come back to it. But, but what that shows is uh, when we kind of jump into the variability of the headings that we issue each night to the UPS aircraft. And again, we're talking, depending on the night, anywhere between 80 and around Christmas time, maybe 125 aircraft. Jeff, I, Captain Jeff, you probably know uh, those numbers better than me. There's a, there's a lot of aircraft that take off out of there. And each one of them is assigned a heading. And that heading means the aircraft takes off and then at at what they deem is the appropriate time, they rotate to that heading, turn the aircraft to that heading. Um, and by eliminating that, um, I think if we can end up getting to that map, then we'll be able to see there's a huge swath of, uh, of variability that'll be taken out of place. And the consistency that we have each night will be much, much better uh, for that entire area, and especially that Yorktown area to the Southwest. And, and, and right now, just a little to, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on, on how air traffic control works, but uh, the, the tower controller switches the departure aircraft to the departure radar controller almost when they're off the runway end. And so by the time the departure controller issues the turn on course, uh, it could be a varying amount of time between the, the transmission and the execution of the turn. And it may be that uh, the departure controllers look at something else on his scope and so he can't issue the turn on course to the subsequent departure as soon as he might like and so that's why you see some of that variability as well and then this will eliminate all those required transmissions because the the pilots the aircraft they're going to know exactly where they're going and they'll execute the turns on their own yeah Mike, I can speak a little bit to of the departures and arrivals at night. Uh, our, our normal flows into the airport are from about 11 p.m. to about uh, 1.32 p.m. If we have somebody late, it might be a little bit later. And then they start departing as early as 3.30, and the departures go to about 6.30. And again, that's if we've had no issues um, with the aircraft or the crews or the, the sort. Uh, those are typically the flows that we fly. Um, Greg, uh, we don't uh, we don't do heading changes until we're at least 400 feet above the air, airport and without direction. And then uh, it typically don't, in my experience, don't come to at least 1,500 to 2,000 where we're handed off to on the frequency, which is good for us because we've got to retract the gear, get away from the ground, start to bring up the flaps, those type of things. 
All right. I think we covered that one. I'm going to keep us moving because we still have some questions coming in. I think this one's a this one's pretty straightforward. Which air traffic controllers work the early morning hours? SDF controllers or does UPS traffic control uh, assist or work those hours for the SDF controllers? Um, Greg Petto, you want to give a quick answer on that one? Yeah, all the air traffic controllers that work at SDF are employed by the FAA, by the Federal Aviation Administration. So we uh, we all work for the taxpayers and uh, we operate 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, and we do have a permanent uh, crew of midnight shift controllers that work. They, they comprise the core of the group that works those overnight hours. And the rest of the controllers rotate through those shifts throughout the course of their work week. So... Uh, Christian has done his fair share. I know I've done my fair share. And um, until you get some seniority, uh, you can expect to see midnight shifts uh, once or twice a week. So are, are there any ramp control? Is there ramp control done by UPS in, in their part of the airport? Or does that not exist at Louisville? Uh, Michael, I can take that one. The only, the only thing is our defined world port area. Um, we were able to push and start engines um, by getting clearance for our ramp control, um, but we do not hit any of the taxiways right. um, until uh, we're cleared by the FA. I mean, by the tower or ground frequency to uh, to proceed, and they give us a direct route to the full, to the intended runway. Great, thanks for clarifying that, Jeff. Because I was just thinking, if somebody's like, "Well, my neighbor does something at the airport for UPS." Uh, <laughs> Right. There may there, be that ramp area in right and around the sorting facility. But before you get out to taxiways and runways, that's all handled, as Greg said, 24-7, 365 by FAA controllers. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. And so let me explain that one a little bit more detail, Michael, because, uh, you know, a lot of things we just take for granted that everybody knows. Um, we, um, as the pilots, don't um, request or tell ramp control that we're load complete until we've... Uh, Shut all the doors. Uh, we've run all of our checklists, and we're ready to push. We let the ground ground crew know once we're cleared to push by our ramp control, and then they'll push us back. Again, there's probably more than one airplane that's trying to get out that ramp, so we got to deconflict within just those ramp areas as well. So it's uh, it's another detailed process that we have to go through um, before we even start talking to the ground frequencies. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, doing a quick time check. Looks like it's 4.45 Eastern, so I'm going to try to keep us moving. Still have questions coming in. Will the airspace around Louisville get bigger, like to a Bravo? Um, Christian, maybe you could take that one and, and maybe explain why I said something funny like Bravo. Right. So uh, I would guess that question might have been asked by someone who understands airspace designations. So for those that don't, they have designations. A, B, C, D, depending on the type of aircraft, the utilization, size of the airport. Uh, Louisville surrounded by a Class C airspace. Um, so as Greg mentioned earlier, no. To the immediate Class C that we see red around the airspace, there's no changes to that. Uh, to accommodate the new procedures, there were some uh, boundary changes with some other uh, airspaces. Lexington's tweaked a little bit. Uh, Indianapolis approach is tweaked a little bit uh, on some boundary lines to allow the airspace, the air traffic uh, to flow into the airport and these new procedures, but anything around the immediate uh, airport in that class E uh, surface area has not been affected at all. And, right, and a, a Bravo airspace is a very, I mean, when you start talking about that, you're looking at Chicago, Atlanta, Los Angeles, the East Coast with New York and LaGuardia and those, those are, it's pretty, it's, it's, they have pros and cons uh, determined uh, probably not to be right for this airport. But certainly not this project. This project does not implement that. All right. Th thanks, Christian. All right. If this proposal is approved, how many how many increased flights will will be projected? Um, several people could probably jump in on that. Uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, I'll take that if you don't, if you don't mind terribly. Um, none. Really, it will, while we think it's going to increase capacity, we're fairly confident it will for the airspace. That has nothing to do with the amount of flights coming in and out. The amount of flights is purely market driven. Uh, the FAA doesn't control that per se. So uh, it, the short answer is none. 
no increase in flights. However, over time, we've seen, you know, in general, there's an increase in flights across the NAS, and I would expect that uh, not to slow down unless something dramatic happens again, like COVID. Um, but yeah, it'll strictly be market demand that will uh, create any increases at Louisville. Well, I certainly hope that doesn't happen uh, again. Thank you, Jeffrey. And again, the, the project's not about adding capacity. It's it's not driven by that. It's really some of the points that you've heard us touch on, procedural separation, the safety and efficiency aspects that align with the FA mission. And my okay. Is that something UPS doesn't Please, uh, Jeff. They don't change their network based on uh, changes in arrivals. It's it's all market driven, as, uh, as uh, Jeff Chester said. Great. Thanks for the, the additional info. Looking to see if anybody else is adding. Has anything else to add? All right. Can you tell us more about the history of noise abatement at Louisville? Uh, we've, we've heard that going back quite a few years, UPS and the airport have worked together to try and address noise issues. All right. That's, that sounds like it's teed up for Natalie and, and Captain Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. So uh, noise abatement issues at SDF have been in effect um, really since the early 90s. And UPS has obviously been a big part of that conversation and those efforts that are put in place, like I said before, for the airport to be a good neighbor. Um, we know people that live near the airport or have those noise concerns. Obviously, um, you know, we have a number of passenger traffic um, increases that we've seen post-COVID especially, and then obviously we are a global cargo hub. We're the third busiest cargo airport in the world, fifth in North America, so we do have a number of flights obviously coming and going, um, especially through those nighttime hours. So um, there are programs in place. I think we mentioned earlier our Quieter Home program, where we touch on um, those folks that live within a certain area um, that are outlined through that noise compatibility compatibility program. We have our voluntary relocation program, um, mostly to the south of the airport, again, to have that less populated area, minimizing those impacts again, um, you know, and, and, and looking obviously at the, the procedures that I know have been discussed numerous times, um, you know, um, throughout tonight's workshop, as far as the contraflow efforts, um, the preferred routes and that type of stuff. So um, we do take this very seriously from the airport side. That's why it's great to have partners like UPS and our, our passenger carriers who work with us, who can look at these things um, and obviously the FAA too, um, to help make sure that we're, we are being a good neighbor and being a good steward in the community. And so I don't know if Jeff, if you have anything else you'd wanna add from your side of stuff. <laughs> Well, thanks, Natalie. I, UPS has very been very proud to participate with the FAA and the airport authority on, on this project. And we've been doing this for a good eight, 10 years. Isn't that, I think that's about right, Christian. And, and we've uh, spent hundreds of hours in the, in the simulator testing these procedures and making sure that they work. And it's not only to benefit UPS, it's to benefit all the airlines. Um, and it benefits the community. I, one of the things I'd like to really hit on is, is that this is a win-win-win situation. It, it's uh, improved safety because we're going to be talking less people on the arrival coming in. It, uh, it's a more efficient arrival. And then the CO2 emissions in our community will be reduced just by, and from UPS by 60,000 uh, tons of uh, CO2 emissions. So it really is a win-win-win for everybody um, uh, as far as, as I can see. Um, and so we're happy to, we've been very happy to participate and be a part of this. Very good. Thank, thank you both. Um, moving to the next question. Has, has the FAA made changes like this at other airports? I'll, I'll jump in. Others can add if you want, but uh, I've certainly been involved in, for example, the Florida Metroplex project where we updated procedures for 21 airports in uh, one of the busiest aviation state, the busiest aviation state in the in the southern region. Um, also, similar procedures in Raleigh, in my part of the world, and we're looking at future projects as well. So it's it's exciting whenever we can modernize the procedures and implement new technology and bring the benefits that we've been talking about. I am responsible for one of nine regions, but 
my peers around the country all have similar projects. So this is something that certainly we've done a number of places. Um, working to upgrade, as we touched on earlier, moving from ground-based nav aids and some of those limitations to the, the benefits of satellite-based procedures. So I think that covers that question. I don't see anybody adding. So uh, let's see, what is the nighttime flow departure on runways 17 right and 17 left? Um, Christian, do you wanna start with that? Uh, I would say yes, that is the answer. Yeah, 17 uh, at nighttime uh, in the middle of the night, 17 left and 17 right is a determination to uh, get away from those more populated areas of the city. Uh, it changes at various times, as, as I mentioned. Natalie, you you probably know that better than me. I I have to use the chart to figure out when we change because it happens a lot, but I, I suppose you have to discuss it more. So maybe you know those times better if you want to recount them. But to that question, yeah, we during the night, try to stay to the south and away from uh, some of the more populated areas downtown. Um, forgive me, Muff, uh, I cut out a little bit. You did say my name right, Christian. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I figured you probably knew those times better than me uh, you deal with those more. So I, I joked I always have to go to the chart to figure out uh, when it is. So, uh, but yeah, no, no, no worries. So, um, uh, as Christian mes mentioned, yes. So, kind of those times are we have the preferred uh, south flow from three a.m. Um, uh, you know where the they have runways uh, for noise. Obviously, uh, the south flow is from three a.m to 9 a.m. Uh, and then the north flow from 9 to 2, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., south flow from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m., and then the north flow uh, from 10 to 3. But really, contraflow is kind of the main noise abatement during those nighttime hours um, from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., which is when um, it, it's our primary noise abatement effort where we have all run, uh, all aircraft, I'm sorry, take off and land to the south uh, uh, when weather dictates that we're able to, obviously, the the tower can determine when other factors may come into play that that's not feasible for whatever reason. But this procedure really recommends that that they are arriving and departing to the south. Again, that is over that less populated area um, where a number of families were moved as part of our voluntary relocation program um, that, that spanned decades to, again, kind of really minimize the noise impact over those least populated areas. So. Okay. All right, we have a, a question. It looks like maybe from a pilot. How will the proposed changes affect arrivals to CVG, to Cincinnati Covington from the West? Currently, Indy Center has arrivals very low, flight level 230 and below so 23,000 feet, to get under this traffic. Sometimes initial descents are ordered 400 nautical miles from landing. I'm all for efficiency, but all airports need to be considered. Uh, Jeffrey Chester, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I actually had that one. Michael, that'd be great. I'm, I'm kind of excited somebody asked this question because, um, and as Christian will tell you, um, we probably spent 100 hours developing interlocking procedures. Um, and, and I know that sounds, uh, you know, Louisville isn't that close to Cincinnati, but, but from an airline airspace situation, it's extremely close. And it's also very close to Indianapolis. And Indianapolis has procedures in place that are being modified uh, with the implementation of this procedure. Cincinnati also has procedures, uh, new procedures, all coming in, uh, projected in March of 2024, at this point, um, and we spent hundreds, I, I say hundreds, hundreds of hours interlocking those procedures, ensuring that each arrival was on the most efficient, uh, most efficient altitude and route possible. Um, and, and while some of the routes at to Cincinnati have been uh, adjusted slightly, uh, maybe left or right to accommodate climb outs from Louisville or uh, altitudes have been adjusted uh, to where Cincinnati arrivals from the West will come in higher. They'll come in significantly higher than they do today. Um, so it's for the entire airspace, uh, it's an extreme upgrade in efficiency. 
Um, the, the Louisville arrivals coming from the Northeast come over the, the Cincinnati landing area there, or yeah, the Cincinnati airport, they're going to come in higher than they currently do. Um, and, and higher and, and on that profile kind of rolling downhill, not under heavy power, all of these airports are going to be coming in with those sorts of procedures designed and in play. And the amount of time that, that everybody has put in to make sure that these procedures work and that they don't interfere with each other, that aircraft aren't held at altitudes that are inefficient, that climbs continue, that descents continue, that flight tracks had to be adjusted two miles south or two miles north or whatever it might be. Um, it's exciting to me to see what it's going to be like. To, to what it's going to be like for the pilots, for the airlines, for, for the individual pilot out there. Um, it's going to be so much better uh, once both of these projects come through, uh, once the Indianapolis project is adjusted. Uh, they're out there. Uh, and, and honestly, I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm excited for it. And I'm excited that somebody asked, so I got to talk about it. <laughs> so thank you. Whoever asked that question, thanks so much. I appreciate it. So Jeffrey, I'll, I'll add a quick add-on or a Please. plug, if you will. But if you if you do a quick internet search for FAA Southern Region, you can go under Community Engagement. Or if you just go to FAA Community Engagement, click on Southern Region, you can get it either way. But we have a list of projects like this project at Louisville, but there's a video link that's posted on the Cincinnati project as well. So if you're interested in seeing a project video for Cincinnati, take a look and um, for the the pilots in attendance that that may be maybe some interesting information as Jeffrey said coming coming soon to a nearby airport in 24. All right it is 459 I'm going to ask one more question that any or all on the panel can can chime in on how do you know the new procedures will be safe so we've talked a lot about safety and I'll let you all jump in on that one a lot of work Christian, I saw you You hop on off mute first. Sure. Well, I just want to touch on a few things that folks have mentioned during the meeting that might have gone unnoticed. I think Jeff just mentioned 100 hours of time put in on this. Jeff Kozak earlier mentioned this has been a, in process for 10 years. Um, this thing has been looked at and reviewed and examined. Uh, I mean, a ton. We've really gone over it. We've looked at it. This wasn't a not to be flippant, but a group of people who kind of got together over the weekend and over some beers just said, hey, how about this? Let's try this. We've looked at all these options. We've considered all these things. Uh, experience tells us what works now, what would have worked better. And I think in regard, one of the examples I, I try to use with safety is, uh, you know, 10 years ago, had I bought a motorcycle and a helmet, um, I would have been safe then. If I buy a motorcycle and a helmet today, improvements have been made. Uh, technology's caught up. Things are better. I wasn't unsafe then. I just was as safe as I could be. I could be safer now. And we've identified some of these issues as safer now, and uh, but not at the sacrifice to, uh, I think it was it was well put by Captain Kozak, the win-win-win scenario. We did not sacrifice the community to get these. We did not put the pilots out to get these. The air traffic controllers don't have to hate to come into work to get these. We really tried to focus on win-win-wins and safety being the biggest the biggest point of that. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, if, I, if I could add to that, Michael, you know, we got in the simulator and flight, te flight tested them in different different type of aircraft at different at max weights, at maximum weights, uh, and we we're still able to meet all the procedures. And what Christian and Greg and Jeff would, could tell you is, is not only did they have to design it, but it also has to meet the criteria of spacing and how soon two points. I learned so much from being around them is that. I said, oh, let's just put a point there. He goes, well, it's too much off heading and it's too close to the other point. doesn't meet requirements. So there, there was a lot to it um, that, and it's met all those requirements and been reviewed and reviewed and reviewed. In fact, our last flights, we had folks, um, uh, Eric Johnson from the FAA and uh, I forget the other gentleman's name that came up and flew and watched us fly them after um, we'd worked them and worked them. So. It's had a lot of oversight. I don't. It's not a safety concern at all, uh, from a pilot perspective, because we always operate the airplane safely. It's, this is just a procedural change. Thank you, Jeff. Greg, did you have something to add? 
I just want to mention, you know, that these procedures are going to, again, be procedurally separated. Uh, it's going to give us a lot more predictability in flight routes, and we know where the planes are going to turn. We know what altitudes they're going to be at. Uh, the, the the flight crews are not going to have to answer frequent radio communications from the controllers. So it's going to be uh, immensely safer. And uh, that predictability and that safety is going to be, I think, uh, one of the biggest success stories of this of this entire program. Thanks, Greg. Hey, Jeffrey. Yeah, I will just throw in that the FA has uh, very stringent guidelines uh, for safety and for design criteria, and that design criteria has to fit a wide, wide range of aircraft. Uh, so, fitting within those stringent criteria uh, obviously is all about safety. So uh, working through that process, uh, we, we're highly confident this is as safe as we can make it today. All right, great set of answers. I, I was going to share some of that. You guys stole my thunder. But the only thing I'll add is at FAA, it's always about safety. And um, I think everybody touched on a lot of great points, but really, it's the safest it can be when more aircraft are able to utilize these procedures. And that's going to be the case in the future for Louisville. So we've, we've had procedures in the past, but we haven't been able to utilize all of the capabilities of those procedures. So as we get more aircraft on, we get those benefits for more of the, the air, aviation population in and around the Louisville airspace. So exciting for us. Uh, thanks to thanks to the team. Not trying to cut anybody off, but I know we're 504, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump over and just announce that brings us to the end of the workshop. So I want to thank everybody for attending. We, we had a lot of great questions, and I hope that the answers from our airport, air traffic control, and pilot community, environmental specialists were were all informative. Uh, Please remember this is not the end of the conversation. So I've mentioned a couple times we have one more workshop this Thursday, November 16th at 6 p.m. Uh, you also want to um, know that you can we, we want you to know that you may still formally comment on the proposed procedures. You may email your comments to the email address shown on your screen or if you have your smartphone handy, you can scan the QR code and that'll get you the address just to send those comments to us. If you prefer, you can mail a comment. Um, please note that all the comments must be sent by December 22nd, 2023. So once again, I wanna thank all of the specialists who served on the panel this afternoon for providing a wide range of expertise. Remember this workshop has been recorded, that recording including all of the slides, the videos at the beginning, the addresses, the QR code, all the information will be available on FA's YouTube channel right after we conclude. And I hope that you all have a great day. Thanks so much for participating.